Guts and Glory is a look at the music of Bieber and Schmelzer. These were fantastic musicians performing and working in Vienna and Salzburg in the middle of the 1600s. There was a huge explosion of culture and musical patronage after the Thirty Years' War and lots and lots of trumpet players started to learn how to use their embouchures, their lips, to play higher notes, which meant that they could play much more melodic music and they could play with greater subtlety. So this meant they could come inside for once instead of playing outside on a battlefield and they could join other instruments. And Bieber and Schmelzer, who were really prolific composers, they wrote music for very large mixed ensembles including choirs of trumpets and choirs of strings and we're really looking at that in the project today. It's heroic music for strings, trumpets and drums. The main difference on this project is that we're all playing in a quite experimental way. For one of the first times in this country, a Baroque ensemble is using natural trumpets with no finger holes, quite a large mouthpiece. This is a, a copy of an original mouthpiece. And it has a big impact on how we play as a group. The intonation, the tonality, the sound, everything that we take for granted when we're playing normally actually completely changes once we start to use these instruments. And these are as original as they would have been. There's nothing here to help us change the notes other than control of our lips and lots of air. These instruments are completely as the composers would have known. And it's only really in the last 10, 15 years that we've begun to understand how these players would have played them originally. Up until now, we've always added finger holes to our natural trumpets, which is not an original invention. They would have just played without any of the assistance here. And so the notes are exactly where they lie on the harmonic series. This means that some of them are not exactly where you think they would be, and this causes a lot of interesting problems which need solving in a rehearsal like this. It's been really fascinating because usually when we play with trumpets in an orchestra, they're the sort of icing on the, on, on the orchestral cake, if you like. They'll sort of come in at the last minute play very loud. We don't usually get an awful lot of no negotiation with, with trumpets. Um, whereas in this kind of music, which is almost com composed like polychoral music, so we have trumpets play something as a group, strings respond. And so we're very attuned to all of the inflections which trumpets are giving. Um, and that's fascinating because that we don't often get to do that. Because of the difference in the instrument they're using, it's so much different how we blend together uh, and we try when, when they finish playing and it's our turn we find we have to approach it very differently and because we heard something which is in a way unusual from hearing from the trumpets we, we also like oh let's try to match this sound when we started this project and, and you know like thinking oh my god we have to play with five trumpets and uh, we actually prepared earplugs and, and all sorts of things because we were afraid of the sound which might come out and uh, actually I find it it's not very hard at all to, to match the sound and it sounds much smoother and nicer and warmer than what we would have expected. The one challenging thing has been intonation, I think that's probably would echo what most of the string players would say um, because the, the type of you know the, the, the notes you get from a natural trumpet are not what we are accustomed to hearing that's that's been a really big challenge has, has been adapting to those kind of things so well we just decided to put up with it and <laughs> just wrap it out and see what happens enjoy it even enjoy <laughs>Just a couple of quick words about the different tools we are using here. Um, we're using all gut strings on, in the violins, which makes the G string extremely fat. First of all, we had a couple of problems how to fit them on the instruments because the, the, the traditional 
holes in the in the tailpiece and in the pegs are just not usually not big enough. So we spent hours and hours trying to put on fat G strings and then trying to make sound out of it because uh, it's just a very different way of using the tools we have. And also we are using very different bows. This short bow, which is actually shorter than my violin, pretty much. So I can get away with a violin case this week, which it looks like a saxophone case. Uh, so I feel really cool this week. Um, the frog is fixed, so we're using an underhand bow hold, which means we can actually influence the tension of the, of the hair with, with our thumbs, like a little bit trying to press it or release it according to what we are playing. Our typical bow hold would be with our, th our thumb on, on, on the stick here. Um, which allows us to sort of lift the bow off the string and be a bit more off the, off the string with our strokes. But with this, you're sort of much more string bound and the, the strokes come from the string and it's, it gives a very, very different kind of articulation. This is the normal viola, normal, um, which uh, is, so often this music is uh, split into three parts, three viola parts, um, sometimes two, sometimes four. Um, but for all of the kind of the first part, which is always kind of in the upper register of the instrument, we've been using this instrument, which is um, the normal kind of dimensions that, that most violas are. And, you know, it's, it works well for that part because you never really play on the lower two strings. With the, this kind of the length of string that you get on this viola, the C string is really hard to, to make it work properly. So that's why we put this one on the top part. Big Ted, uh, who's been played by Nicola, is always on, the, always on the lowest line. And we feel that it works really well because he's huge. <laughs> well, I'm playing on this not very often seen instrument called the Dalcian. And um, well, basically, um, it looks maybe a bit unfamiliar, a bit like a, a sawn-off shotgun, maybe, uh, even. Um, it's basically the Renaissance precursor of the bassoon as we know it. And it's the same principle built, so it's like a doubled over bore inside the tube. The air goes like this and then all the way around. So although it's quite short, it actually plays in an eight-foot bass register. It's really fun, it's nice because it's like this instrument can be quite strong in sound and especially in attack, so it's, it's lovely to, to play with brass instruments. As a keyboard player, this experience is really very interesting. The, the one thing that I most enjoy about Baroque music is the harmony. So normally when we perform in many a venue, we choose the bog standard Velocity temperament, which many period orchestras in the country and indeed the world use because it's simple, it works with a lot of the repertoire. It's not equal temperament, but it doesn't bring out perhaps the pure harmonies of certain keys. With the repertoire we're tackling essentially calls for perhaps an earlier style of temperament, which is um, we've decided to be six comma mean tone. However, there is a much deeper underlying question with all of this, and that's the ventless trumpet. The reality is that the ventless trumpet is, is nature. It's, an, it's, it's the harmonic series. That is what ultimately dictates what's going to come out. So having the natural trumpet, the ventless natural trumpet upon us means that actually Temperaments, in the way that we know them, are <laughs> thrown out the window, frankly, because we temper things to make our Western 21st century ears um, attempt to recreate a world in the 18th century and make it sound nice. But the reality is that the trumpets might not sound quite in place with that temperament. And that to me poses a very important question, and that is, well, who is going to accuse them of being out of tune? Because in reality, they are what nature mandates. We are all out of tune. It is us who are out of tune. Actually, we're not going to shy away from the, the reality that a trumpet A is mathematically right in between X and Y. We're not going to shy away from, from the fact that it doesn't quite match our tempered A. We need to actually expose that and get used to it and 
and transcend the barriers that tonality has placed upon us and retrain our ears. I like the way that they are just completely tied to what these instruments do. You get what you get, but you can't get other things that you may expect to want or that you used to from this instrument also, because it also has certain like kind of very earthy and basic qualities that, that just come with it. And if you let it be, that's just there and it's very strong. And if you try to kind of mess around and get something else from it, it will probably tell you, mm, that's not me. That's like the Baroque bassoon or something else later on. So I really love that we, we go back to, to what these instruments do and it's very much what's in that music as well. Understanding this music actually requires the instruments of the time and from playing the as correct, the, as close as we can get to the original instruments, we're learning from what they can teach us. Like any master craftsman will tell you, the work teaches you what you have to do. And in our case, the instrument teaches you how you have to play it. This music comes from a period when the trumpet is really uh, being used in two ways. It's being used on the battlefield and for, as a signaling instrument. And it's also starting to be used in art music um, in the high extremity of the register. There's a certain symbolism that goes with that in that the music in the low register was traditionally associated with earth and war and on the battlefield. And the, the higher in the register was the association with angels and heaven and God and kings. We're still learning about this instrument and how to use it. This uh, ensemble you know, has been a fantastic opportunity to actually do that in situ. We're not saying that this is the way to do it, it's a way to do it. You know, within the ensemble, we're finding a balance between what we can do on the trumpet and what we can do with other players and whether that limits their musicianship and whether that limits our musicianship. Obviously, we're in the very beginning stages of addressing that balance, but it's great work to start. <laughs>